I want you to remember the summer after your freshman year of high school. So maybe you had a summer job, maybe you got to travel, maybe you just got to kick it at home for a couple months. For me, uh, a little bit before I started my sophomore year of high school, I was sitting in a courtroom. So maybe you've seen a courtroom like this in person or on TV. Think high ceilings and dark wood and the kind of solemn silence that comes along with people's fates being decided. Now in court, people are often dressed in their best dark suit or maybe whatever streetwear they had on the night that they got arrested. That day in court, I was wearing one of the handful of outfits that I'd been carting around with me in a black hefty bag. Think early 90s hip hop gear, baggy pants, and like a rip off Carl Kanai striped shirt. <laughs> so just a couple of weeks earlier, I'd been dragged out of my apartment in the Old Harbor Projects of South Boston by half a dozen police officers. And after spending a couple nights in jail, the powers that be decided that I was a better candidate for the child welfare system than for the juvenile justice system. Very lucky for me. And that's how I came to be sitting in this courtroom that day, listening to a handful of strangers, think social workers and lawyers and a judge, discussing my fate. And I was starting to get nervous because they were talking about moving me out of Boston. So the judge, maybe sensing my anxiety, looked over at me and interrupted the proceedings and said, son, where do you want to be? So I just blurted out the only thing that I had on my mind, which is, I don't care where you put me as long as you keep me in Boston. So the judge was curious as to why I was so fixated on staying in the city, and I explained that I was attending Boston Latin School and I really didn't want to leave. So the judge, being a Bostonian, understood what Boston Latin meant. This is the oldest school in the country. It's educated the likes of John Hancock and Sam Adams and Ben Franklin, even though Ben did drop out. So he understood what this meant, and he turned to the other decision makers and issued his fiat and said, all right, make sure he stays. So stay I did, first back to the group home, um, and then after a little while was lucky enough to be placed in a foster home where I stayed until I graduated just barely from Latin and went off to college. So if the judge hadn't interceded that day and asked me what I needed and, and gave it to me, I think that I probably wouldn't be standing up here talking to you tonight, because the odds are I would have wound up like so many of the kids that I grew up with in the projects and live with in foster homes and group homes, dead or in jail or just scraping by. And so the lesson that I learned in that courtroom that day is one that I've gone on to preach and to practice in my career ever since, which is that we just have to center the voices of the people that we're trying to serve. So I've heard people get applause lines for making that point for the last three days. So I think that this room is more or less persuaded that we should be centering the voice of the community. But just in case you have any lingering doubts, let me ask you a question. Do you know what's best for you and your family? Do you? Yes. Well, guess what? So do people that are living with low incomes. They work extraordinarily hard, often at multiple jobs, and they navigate complicated and difficult economic choices every day of the week and keep persisting despite very long odds. They value education enormously and invest in their children's opportunity. And the science tells us that people living with low incomes actually know the value of a dollar better than the vaunted middle class. So what we should be doing as people with any kind of power within these systems is giving these people more control over their lives and not less. OK, so you probably agree with me, right? Like we're all in this room for the same reason. We want to create systems and programs and services that give people the opportunity that they need to make their families healthy and give their kids an opportunity to be well as adults. So then I'm perplexed about why we tolerate such crappy policies and services. Think, for example, about something like TANF. Why do we accept such a rudimentary and invasive program instead of collectively demanding something like unconditional cash transfers? Think about Medicaid. Why is this the thing that we give healthcare through, um, maybe even with work requirements, 
instead of saying that we need universal health care? Why is it that collectively, if we really believe in listening to the family's voice, that we think that basic needs are unreasonable demands and pipe dreams, instead of demanding that a society with so much money and so many resources just give people a dignified floor to live on? So I'm gonna reflect back on the prompt that Courtney told you about earlier that we were asked to reflect on when we were preparing them for this talk that posed a dichotomy between being nurturing and caring about families and having high expectations. And I'm gonna to propose to you that that's probably the wrong question to be asking. And that if we have corrosive low expectations of anyone, it's ourselves. We need to demand of ourselves that we create and enact better social policy and programs. And so now maybe um, you think, that's great, Anthony, but like, uh, as powerful as this room is, we're not going to go out and have a UBI tomorrow, sorry. And fair enough, that's kind of a blue sky thing. But let me propose to you that there are things that you can do when you go back home tomorrow or Monday to actually listen to and act on the voices of the community. So now maybe you're like me and you do research and you think you're doing awesome work because you do participatory action research and you really integrate the voice of the community into your findings. But let me ask you, are you actually using the voice of the community to define the research questions that you're pursuing? Maybe you work at a nonprofit and you're patting yourself on the back because you've got a really active community advisory board. But let me ask you, how many of those community members have voting seats on your board of directors. Maybe you're in philanthropy and you're really jazzed up about the awesome surveys that your grantees keep passing you, showing you how great a job they're doing with the folks in the community. But why aren't you asking those community members to give your program officers instructions on how to expend your philanthropic largesse? We need to have higher expectations for ourselves. So let me leave you with this. I want you all to go back home and emulate that judge. I want you to find the moment where you can stop the proceedings, ask the people what they need, and then do everything in your power that you can to make that reality. Thanks.